The Perhelion of Prohibition by H. L. Minkin from the Sydney, Australia Bulletin, July 20th, 1922. This piece, of course, is now of only antiquarian interest, but I am printing it to recall to America what went on during the glaring noonday of Prohibition when its agents controlled all branches of the government at Washington and in most of the states, and its end seemed far away. There is yet no adequate history of those years. Americans always tend to forget things so disagreeable. They have put the memory of Prohibition out of their minds, just as they have put the memory of the great influenza epidemic of 1918 and 19. Prohibition, by constitutional amendment, has been in force in the United States for three years, everywhere with the full power of the federal government behind it, and in most of the 48 states with stringent state laws to help. The results of that colossal effort to enforce it may be briefly summarized as follows. 1. The state and federal governments, taken together, have lost the $500 million annual revenue that was formerly derived from excises and licenses, and general taxation has had to be increased to make it up. 2. There has been created, at the cost of $50 million a year, a great army of prohibition detectives, spies, and agent provocateurs, four-fifth of whom are already corrupt. 3. There has been created another army of so-called bootleggers, dealing partly in wines and liquors smuggled from Canada and the West Indies, and partly in beers, wines, and liquors manufactured illicitly at home, and its members take a joint profit that is certainly not less than $750 million a year, and probably runs to $1.5 billion. 4. Brewing and distilling and winemaking have been re-established as home industries, and the business of supplying them necessary materials, malt syrup, bottles, corks, etc., has taken on gigantic proportions. 5. In every American city, and in nine-tenths of the American towns, every known alcoholic beverage is still obtainable, at prices ranging from 100% to 500% above those of pre-prohibition days. And even in the most remote county districts, there is absolutely no place in which any man who desires to drink alcohol cannot get it. In brief, prohibition is a failure, and it grows a worse failure every day. There was a time, shortly after the 18th Amendment went into effect, when it showed some promise of being a success, especially in the farming regions, and on the strength of that promise, very optimistic reports were sent broadcast by the extremely diligent press agents of the Anti-Saloon League and a number of confiding foreigners. For example, Sir Arthur Newholm, the Englishman, were made to believe that the New Jerusalem was actually at hand. But that was simply because the great majority of Americans had not been taking the thing seriously, because they had been caught unawares by the extraordinarily drastic provisions of the Volstead Enforcement Act. The instant they realized what was upon them, they applied the national ingenuity and the national talent for corruption to the problem, and in six months it was solved. On the one hand, they devised a great multitude of schemes for circumventing the law. On the other hand, they proceeded gallantly to the business of debauching the officers sworn to enforce it. Since then, there has been a continuous struggle between guns and armament, with guns gradually drawing into the lead. No man, not even the most romantic prohibitionist, argues that there is anything remotely resembling a general enforcement of prohibition today. And no unbiased and reflective man, so far as I know, sees the slightest sign that it will ever be enforced hereafter. The business of evading it and making a mock of it, in fact, has ceased to wear any of the customary aspects of crime and has become a sort of national sport. The criminal in the public eye is not the bootlegger and certainly not his customer, but the enforcement officer. This newfangled agent of justice 
has begun to take on an almost legendary character. He is looked upon by the plain people as corruption incarnate, a villainous snooper and blackmailer whose sole public function is to increase the price of drinks. When he comes into court for attacking an illicit distiller with firearms, as happens often, juries handle him roughly. Not infrequently, he is mobbed while he is at his work. The effects of this public sentiment are obviously very damaging to the morale of the service. In the federal branch, there is a constant changing of personnel, and the average agent now lasts no more than six months. In that time, if he is honest, he has become disgusted by the work he is called upon to do, and alarmed by the general view of it. And if, as is probably more usual, he has gone into it simply to get as much as he can while the getting is good, he has made enough to retire. I have heard of one federal agent in New York who, on a salary of $2,000 a year, paid $4,000 rent for his apartment and kept two automobiles. Most of the strong liquors sold in the large cities of the East come either from Canada or from the Bahamas. Those from Canada are brought across the international border in large motor lorries, and the business is so extensive and so well organized that the bribes paid to the officers employed to oppose it, both on the Canadian side and on the American side, are standardized. And so, barring accident, a bootlegger can estimate the cost of his goods to within a few dollars a case, and prepare for financing his operations accordingly. The supplies that come from the Bahamas are transported in small schooners. Some put it by night at lonely places along the immense American coast, where motor transportation awaits their cargoes. Others boldly enter the ports, and the customs officers are either deceived with false manifests or boldly bribed. Most of the stuff thus brought in is Scotch whiskey. In pre-Prohibition days, it sold in New York at from $30 to $40 a case. Now it brings in from $80 to $110, according to the supply. In the main, it is honest goods, but some of the lesser bootleggers, those who sell it not by the case but by the bottle, sophisticate it with homemade imitations, chiefly compounded of cologne spirits, prune juice, pepper, and creosote. Very little gin is imported, for it is too easily made at home. As for wines, the bootleggers chiefly confine their attentions to champagne, which brings $120 a case in New York. Under the Volstead Act, it is perfectly lawful to import wines for medicinal and sacramental purposes. The bootleggers import champagne as medicine and then trust to the venality of the prohibition enforcement officers to get it released to the general trade. The business of bringing in still wines is now almost entirely in the hands of Jewish rabbis in the ghettos of the coast towns. The law allows a Jew in good standing to buy 15 gallons of wine a year for ritualistic use. These gentlemen of God in return for a profit of from $10 to $15 a case, inscribe all solvent comers on their books as Orthodox Ashkenazim. And if the customer has money enough, he may go upon the books of a dozen different rabbis and under a dozen different safely Jewish names. As I have said, very little gin is imported though the widespread popularity of the cocktail makes a steady and immense demand for it. It is manufactured at illicit distilleries, or by the simple process of diluting grain alcohol to 50% strength and adding a few drops of juniper oil and glycerin to the quart. It sells at from $40 to $65 a case, according to quality. All the known liqueurs are made by the same bootleggers, even absinthe. The necessary oils and herbs are imported from France, Italy, and Germany, and added to a mixture of alcohol, water, and syrup. Some of the liqueurs thus concocted are of surprisingly good quality. In fact, the absinthe now on tap in New York is quite as good as the Swiss absinthe formerly sold in the bars. 
it costs $15 a quart. Everywhere south of New York, so-called corn whiskey, made of maize, is manufactured in stupendous quantities. In one southern state, there are said to be no less than 10,000 stills in operation. It is an extremely bad drink, but the native palate, particularly in the country, favors it, and in the cities it is often transformed by devious arts into a very fair rye whiskey. It sells for from $10 to $30 a gallon. I have left beers and light native wines to the last. The extent to which brewing has been revived in the home in the United States is almost incredible. In some states, every second housewife has become a brewer, and some of the beers and ales thus produced are extremely agreeable. A batch of wort may be cooked in an hour, the fermenting is over in four or five days, and two weeks after bottling, the brew is fit to drink. In one American city of 750,000 inhabitants, there are now 100 shops devoted exclusively to the sale of beer-making supplies, and lately the proprietor of one of them, by no means the largest, told me that he sold 2,000 pounds of malt syrup a day. 2,000 pounds of malt syrup will make 4,000 gallons of prime ale. It costs two cents a pint bottle to make. When the breweries were still running, the cheapest beer cost about four cents. Before Prohibition, the American people drank very little wine. They were, in fact, just beginning to appreciate their excellent California wines when the 18th Amendment was passed. Some of the California grape growers, in despair, plowed up their vineyards and planted oranges and olives. Now they wish that they had been less hasty. Last autumn, wine was made in hundreds of thousands of American households, and the price of grapes rose to $125 a ton. I know of no American home, indeed, in which some sort of brewing, winemaking, or distilling is not going on. Even in the country, where belief in prohibition still persists, practically every housewife at least makes a jug or two of blackberry cordial. Every known fruit is expectantly fermented. In the cities, raisins and currants are in enormous demand. Even the common dandelion, by some process unknown to me, is converted into a beverage that gently caresses. Well, if the American people are thus so diligently alcoholic, in the city folk patronize the bootleggers and make beer, and the far-flung yokels experiment with wines and set up stills, why does prohibition remain the law of the land? In the large cities, the majority against it is now at least four to one. In the country, it loses public confidence steadily. Then, why isn't it abandoned, and the vast losses that go with it saved? and the inconceivable corruption abated. The answer is too complex to be made in the space that I have remaining. Part of it lies in the fact that the process of amending the Constitution in the United States is very deliberate and vexatious. It took fully 75 years of persistent agitation to get prohibition adopted, and it will take years of attack to get it formally rejected. But another part of the answer lies in the curious power that fanatical minorities have in American politics, a power that enables them, by playing upon the weaknesses of the two great parties, to overcome their lack of votes.